Well, good morning, Cameron. Very glad to be with you this Sunday morning. Uh, we had, did you move his chair? Thomas has been moving his chair. Now we have to readjust my chair. That's what, anyway, uh, happy Sunday. Today is September 1st, so moving on through the year. Hard to believe that. So we've got September, October, November, just four months to go in 2024. Uh, let us open this morning with a word of prayer. Lord Jesus, we give thanks for this opportunity to be a part of your church. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would use our time together to shape us and mold us into who you would have us to be. Lord, bless this time of worship. Use it to chasten our hearts, to strengthen us by the power of the Holy Spirit, to draw us close to you and make us more like you. Forgive us our sins, O oh Lord. Wash away all our iniquity and unrighteousness and give us strength to be more faithful to your commandments and be ever mindful of your laws and lessons. Open our hearts and minds to your word this morning. Guide us in our reading and understanding by the power of the Holy Spirit. We pray this all in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. All right, this morning we are uh, changing up just a little bit. Uh, the Old Testament goes to Deuteronomy. Chapter 4, verses 1 through 9. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord God of your fathers is giving to you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God which I command you. Your eyes have seen what the Lord did at Baal Peor, for the Lord your God has destroyed from among you all the men who followed Baal of Peor. But you who held fast to the Lord your God are alive today, every one of you. Surely I have taught you statutes and judgments just as the Lord my God commanded me, that you should act according to them in the land which you go to possess. Therefore be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the peoples who will hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us? For whatever reason we may call upon him. And what great nation is there that has such statutes and righteous judgments as are in all this law which I set before you this day? Only take heed to yourself and diligently keep yourself lest you forget the things your eyes have seen, and lest they depart from your heart all the days of your life, and teach them to your children and your grandchildren, especially concerning the day you stood before the Lord your God in Horeb, when the Lord said to me, Gather, me to pe gather the people to me, and I will let them hear my words, that they may learn to fear me all the days they live on the earth, and that they may teach their children. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be, to God. Thanks be to God. Our second reading for today is from the Epistle of St. James, which is my mother's favorite book of the Bible. Uh, St. James chapter 1, 17, verses, uh, excuse me, through verse 27. So chapter 1, 17 to verse 27. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. But be a doer of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, 
and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Now our gospel reading for this morning comes from Mark chapter 7, St. Mark, I should say, chapter 7, verses 1 through 23. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with defiled, and that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. When they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other things which they have received and hold, like the washing of cups and pitchers and copper vessels and couches. And then the Pharisees and scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? And he answered and said to them, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold the tradition of men, the washing of pitchers and cups and many other such things you do. He said to them, All too well you reject the commandment of God that you may keep your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and he who curses father or mother, let him be put to death. But you say, If a man says to his father or mother, Whatever profit you might have received is for me is korban, that is a gift from God. Then you no longer let him do anything for his father or his mother, making the word of God of no effect for your tradition, which you have handed down and many such things you do. When he called the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand, there is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him. Those are the things which defile a man. And if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And when he entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. And he said, What comes out of a man that defiles a man? For from without, from within, out of the heart of men proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness, and these evil things come from within and defile a man. For there he arose and went out to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. For, for a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. And the woman was a Greek, Syrophoenician by birth. And she kept asking him to cast a demon out of her daughter. But Jesus said to her, Let the children be filled first, for it is not good to take the child children's bed and throw it to the little dogs. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the child's children's crumbs. And he said to her, For this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying in the bed. The gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Well, quite a quite a embarrassment of riches this morning on these exciting passages. And it's nice to get to turn back to Deuteronomy. Now, of all the books in the Old Testament, uh, with, you know, possible competition from Isaiah. But certainly all the books of the, of the law and the Torah, uh, Jesus quotes from Deuteronomy most often. I don't even think it's close. Uh, he quotes from Deuteronomy the most. And so it would, it would make sense for us to, in our understanding of the gospel this morning, uh, review this passage 
from Deuteronomy. It's a very important passage. And so here in Deuteronomy 4, we have 1 through 9. Um, and this is coming straight, uh, I suppose, through Moses, right? Right from God. Now, O Israel, listen to the statement, statutes and judgments which I teach you to observe, that you may live and go in and possess the land which the Lord of your fathers is giving you. You shall not add to the word which I command, nor take from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. Now, that idea right there, that you cannot add to or take away from the commandments of God, is very important. Now, uh, that has always been the problem of the church. It's always been the problem of the people of Israel. Uh, this is a consistent problem for the people that God is shepherding, whether they be the Israelites, all of them, or just the Jews, or then the church and the Christians, whether it's the Orthodox Church or the Catholic Church, or the Protestant churches, any of them. It's, it's because it is the struggle of sin. Uh, what God is saying here is very simple. It's just hard to do for us, and that is you keep all the commandments and you don't ignore any of the commandments. And this has become the consistent problem, and, and let me just call it out here, that people will say in nearly every generation, well, things are different now. Well, we've advanced now. Well, you know, that was given to a specific historical place and circumstances, but we are smarter and wiser. And That's the kind of nonsense. But every generation will say that. Every generation thinks that the old rules don't apply to them. Now, if this sounds like your house, if you have teenagers, it's probably very familiar. You set down rules, and then as teenagers grow up, they think that the rules don't apply to them. And I would willing to guess that most of the time, uh, that stems from two things. One is malicious, and one is a little more innocent but naive. The first, which is a little more malicious, is just they don't want to follow the rules. This is very common, not just teenagers, but human beings in general. They want to do something. They know good and well it's against the rules, and so they do it anyway. This is sin. Um, or they know they're supposed to do something, and they don't do it because they don't want to. This is a sin of omission, also sinful. But then you have the more naive, which is not understanding why the rule was given. And so they say, well, I don't understand this rule or this rule doesn't make sense to me. And then they start to try to second guess, well, why did they have that rule? And then that rule might not actually be important because either they don't understand the meeting or they try to come up with their own reasoning which therefore doesn't apply to them. And they think that's a justification for breaking the rule or ignoring the rules. That's what happens. Well, things are different now, or that was in old days. or And here's the truth. This is why religion still matters. Technology obviously changes all the time. None of it has solved the human condition. You can have new technology, people are still greedy. You can have new technology, people are still lazy. You can have new technology, people are still gluttonous. You can have new technology and advancements and the countries and borders change and people are still materialist and lustful and everything else. You can still have technology. Mankind can build the internet, it can go to the moon, it can have cars that drive 300 miles an hour, it can do amazing things. None of it fixes what's broken inside of us, which is spiritual malady. And it does not solve sin. We have the technology, transportation-wise, growing food, formal agricultural technology. No one in this world should have to go hungry. And yet, because of selfishness and politics and sin, there are still plenty of starving people out there. No one should have to be homeless, and yet there are plenty of people homeless. So um, the rules that are given to mankind are not 
rules about technology or advancing it from an engineering standpoint. They're about spiritual problems that still plague humanity because the only solution for what's broken in humanity is God and God through Jesus Christ and the ever-present work of the Holy Spirit in us. That's it. That's the solution. That's our only hope of salvation, not just in the world to come, but in changing our own lives and becoming better people, becoming more of who God wants us to be and created us to be. So that's the, the bottom line here is right out of uh, Deuteronomy is you don't get to break the commandments. You better keep all of them and you don't get rid of any of them. You don't go adding to them, okay? That's important too. Because the minute you start letting people add on to God's commandments, they're going to add on some nonsense. No human being knows the future. So God's commandments are given with his knowledge of the future. We don't know the future. So if human beings start adding on to God's commandments, you're creating problems. Now James, uh, the brother of the Lord, James the Judge, the Bishop of Jerusalem, writes today, um, he says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. In other words, God is constant. His word is constant. There is no variation. There is no shadow of turning. The illumination we receive from God does not change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we might be kinds of first fruits of his creatures. By his word of truth, his commandments are what illuminate our lives. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Now that's very important. The wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Scripture's full of stories when God gets angry. God has wrath too. And God is just in his wrath. But I know this about human wrath. Human wrath is often kind of selfish, selfishly motivated. It is not often justice. It is very, very flawed. And so it's often rooted in vengeance or some other retributive notion. And that is not righteousness. Certainly not godliness. Now, so then, my beloved brethren, let every man swift to hear. Listen. That should be our first thing. Listen. Slow to speak. Be careful what you say. Dr. Ellen Davis at Duke, great new uh, Old Testament professor, used to say, good theology is careful speech. I think she's 100% right. We have to be careful how we talk about God. That is good theology. But also, I think just being a good person, interacting and loving our neighbors is careful speech. Something I have struggled with, I'm often quick to speak. But if we've got to, we've got to focus on listening, listening well, and then thinking what to say. So much of communication it's not just what's said, it's what's left unsaid, unsaid or what is meant. And so how do we communicate? That's a question. And slow to wrath. Take a pause. Be patient. Don't get angry. Let the Holy Spirit deal with things. Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your soul. Receive the word of God. Obviously, Christ is the word of God. No question, the word of God in the flesh. But also the commandments. Work these commandments. But be doers of the word and not hearers only, receiving yourselves. De excuse me, deceiving yourselves. So this is pretty, pretty plain. I mean, James is very plain spoken, he steps on our toes. You can't just know the commandments. You can't just listen and memorize the scriptures. You've got to live that out. So are you doing righteousness? 
So that's not just restricting what you do. In other words, oh, I don't smoke, drink, dance, you know, lustfully act. I don't do certain things. Okay, that's half of it. The commandments are about what you don't do. But there are also commandments about helping the poor, helping the widows, helping the orphans, ministering the prisoners, doing the works that he tells us to. So if you're only doing good works and not restricting your behavior, you're only doing half of it. If you're only restricting your behavior and not doing good works, that is only doing half of it. So this is often uh, a divide between progressive and conservative Christians, okay? Often, conservative Christians are more concerned about restricting, making sure we're not doing bad things. That's good. But we're not as focused on doing the works of mercy and charity. We need to do those. Vice versa, progressives are often focused on the works of mercy and charity, which are good, but they're not as focused on restricting ourselves on how we live our lives that we might restrict sin and abide in holiness. That's not going to work either. You can't have it just half measures. We have to be faithful to God's commandments in what we don't do, not to sin and live in the world, or be of the world, I should say, but we also have to be engaged in the works of mercy and charity and redemption. We have to be instruments of God's forgiveness and his love and mercy. So those things are very important. That is what St. James is saying. You've got to do it. You can't just hear it. You can't just know it. You've got to do it. If anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. He observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but does the work, this one is blessed. I like he says the perfect law of liberty. And I, I, I read this recently, and I don't know who the quote is attributed to, but it says freedom or liberty, you can substitute it, is discipline. Freedom is discipline. And I can tell you how that works in one regard. Um, the sin I obviously struggle with is gluttony, right? I've struggled with my weight for a long time, and I continue to struggle with it. Now, I try to exercise. I'm trying to eat better, and Kate and the boys are trying to support me in that. But there's no question I could be and should be doing a little more, and I need to be more restrictive with my diet. And I'm paying the price on that because what looks like freedom is going on any given day and eating irresponsibly and eating whatever I want. And that looks like freedom. But that is being the opposite of discipline. And that is actually enslavement. Because by just eating gluttonously whatever I want, it restricts my health, it restricts my ability, I'm tired and I will live a shorter life. But the person who is disciplined about their diet and disciplined about their fitness, they can go out and do amazing things that I could never do. They have real freedom that is enabled by their discipline. So the person who is disciplined in their Christian virtue has much more freedom because they can see the truth of the matter. They can see what's really going on in the world. Where those of us who are tricked by sin and temptation, that we think what we have is freedom, but it's all short-term worthlessness. True freedom in God comes from the discipline of obeying his commandments and listening to his word. Just like true freedom in life comes from having health and physical strength and endurance. To go and do things. Now, James and Thomas are pretty fit for their age, and I hope they stay fit. I'm trying to work with them and so they don't end up like this. And I want one day if James and Thomas say, hey, let's go climb Machu Picchu, or let's go backpack across Europe, or let's go 
walk the Great Wall of China, that they will be fit and able to do that. I couldn't do that right now. And if I don't make some big changes, I mean, I may, may have passed me by. I hope to live long enough to get to see them be able to do some of those things. Freedom, ability, true liberty comes from discipline and responsibility to the small things. And that enables long-term freedom. It's like this, all sin is short-term gain. It actually cuts us off from long-term big treasures. Same thing with investing money, right? We could use that as another example. If you spend all your money on little nebulous stuff here, you'll never save your money for those big things that you'll really want, like a house or a car or maybe a boat or those big things. Because if you've spent all your little money on nebulous little things, you'll never get to a point where you can build your credit, build your savings. Short-term benefit absolutely eliminates long-term treasure. Whereas short-term discipline daily, we are storing up for ourselves those treasures, hopefully spiritually, those treasures in heaven. And so James kind of challenges us at the end. It says, if anyone among you thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. Now I will tell you a story. When I was younger than these boys, I was in kindergarten, I think, and I was at home and my brother and I were fighting and I said a bad word in front of Grand Khaki. And Grand Khaki heard me say it, my mother. And boy, did I get in trouble. I mean, Grand Khaki does not tolerate bad words. And so I think I got a spanking, and then I got my mouth washed out with soap, zest soap, it was pretty bad. And then you'd think, well, that was it. No, 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 no. We read the book of James, and I had to read one chapter out loud to her every night for five days. There's five chapters in James. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. So uh, every night that week, I had to out loud read a whole chapter of James. And for a kindergartner or first grade or whatever I was in, that was pretty tough. That was pretty tough. So uh, we get down to this part about the language that we use. Mm. Let me put it this way. The language that we use is important. Often I've heard this, and I'm not saying I'm never guilty, but I want to be clear that it has become much more commonplace, even among Christians, to use profanity. And... I, it is simply unacceptable to use curse words and swear words. It is unacceptable. Now, uh, does it happen? Of course it happens. Is it a sin? Every time it is a sin and it should be repented. Now, let me explain a little bit. All this, this comes, Dr. Jeffrey Wainwright, uh, he taught a class on the philosophy of language. And this subject and these passages from James about the tongue came up in particular. But all profanity deals really with just about three things. It is either, we are, the, all profanity refers to either sex, condemnation, or excrement. And those three things are not things we need to dwell on. Now, here's the point. The language that we use, our common vocabulary, the words that we speak to interact with, to do anything, these are how we apprehend reality. If I said to you, uh, let's describe something, well, the words you would use to describe it uh, are the way you see that little piece of the world. Now, one of my favorite examples, 
and this came out, I don't know, within the last probably 10 or 15 years, that there are scholars who look at ancient history and they have asserted, some literature scholars have asserted, that people about 3,000 years ago or even prior, at least some people in Greece could not see the color blue. They could not see blue. And the reason they make this argument is because they look at one of our earliest examples of literature, certainly Greek literature, Homer in his Iliad and the Odyssey, the epic poem of the Trojan War and the journey home with Odysseus, is that they never use the word blue. Now they describe all the other colors, blood, red, shiny bronze, yellow, all this, but blue is never used. Now, they never describe the sky as blue. They never describe the water as blue. In the Odyssey, which is of course <laughs> where, where Odysseus is traveling by sea from island to island to get home, they, Homer will describe it as the wine dark sea. Now, if you've ever seen the waters in Greece, you know they are some of the clearest, bluest water in the world. The, the snorkeling and scuba diving there is famous. And yet, Homer never uses the word blue. So is it Ulysses purple? We don't know how they saw it exactly. Now, let me give you another example. Recent, I say recently, within my lifetime, I don't know when exactly this research was done, but I saw this on National Geographic, so you know it's good. Um, there is another tribe in Africa, and this is an inland tribe, not anywhere close to the water, and they live in a jungle, very green environment. Now, they showed these people a color wheel I think it had about 12 or 14 circles on it. And all but one of the circles was a shade of green. One circle was blue. Now, when you, they held it up to the camera and showed people, you know, at home. And you looked at it and you saw, okay, there's about 13 green circles, maybe, maybe 11, 11 or 13 green circles, one blue circle. And they say, now, can you pick out the blue one? There it is. Then they said, can you see any difference in the green colors? And I'll tell you the truth. I looked, and all those greens were pretty close. I might have been able to slightly detect some were a little bit darker than some of the others, but I mean... If you told me it was 11 or 13 different shades of green, I could not have differentiated them. From my mind, those are green, that one's blue. They took this same color wheel and they showed it to these people living in that jungle in Africa. Now these people do not get a regular education, they're kind of cut off from the rest of civilization. And interestingly, they said, can you tell us uh, what these colors are. These people live in the jungle. They have some crazy number of names for green. I mean, dark green and light green are two different colors for them. They have two different names for them. They have olive green versus hunter green versus lime green versus, all of those for us are green, but in a jungle environment, those are as different as blue and red and yellow because they are surrounded by green. So their eyes and generations of the people, their whole culture is dependent upon being able to see different shades of green. So what did they think about the blue? They could not see it. They said, could you pick out the blue one. Now this was a medium blue. It was not light like the sky. It was almost a muted royal blue, medium blue. And they'd say, can you find the blue one? And they would stare and could not find it. 
They did not recognize it because it's not a color that they that they that appears in their whole world, their whole experience in that little village. They see the sky, but sky blue is very different than the blue they see here. This was so different for them, they couldn't even see how they're connected. It was fascinating because as much as I felt bad for them and thought, well, blue's right there. Y'all can't even see the blue? They would look at me like I was an idiot because they would see these are all different greens. In fact, they're so different that we have different names for these colors. But to me, they just all look like green. Perception and vocabulary shape our reality. And so if our vocabulary, if the words, words are the building blocks of our reality, your perception makes up the way you understand and apprehend reality. The words that I have in my brain make up they are the building blocks, the bricks, where I'm building my understanding of reality. Okay? And this is why language is helpful, learning different languages, because we learn different words and how different words are connected differently in different languages, and that helps in seeing the world differently. I'm always amazed by French engineering. Now, I, well, I'll be honest, I'm not much for other parts of French culture. Uh, I don't love French food. Uh, my in-laws love French bread and baguettes. You guys like baguettes? They're tasty. No thank you for me, okay? No thank you. But I'm amazed at French engineering because the way they can build bridges or the way their cars work. I remember Jay Leno did a whole special on the air suspension in a Citron French car. Fascinating. They look at engineering differently. Now, America was heavily, heavily influenced early on by the British, but also the German and some Dutch and Scandinavians. But if you look at our engineering in America, it is much similar and continues to be influenced primarily English, German and some Scandinavian. And that's regional. If you go up to the upper Midwest where Scandinavians settle, the way they build things is often influenced by Scandinavian influence. In the Midwest, even down through Texas where there was a lot of German settlers, there's German influence. Chicago, a lot of Polish settlers. Polish people are great thinkers, great engineers. They have a certain way about it. But the French engineering, I mean, I guess you could look at New Orleans, sort of, but not as much in America. But if you go to France and look at how they build their bridges, how they build their cars, how they design things, it's brilliant, but it's so different than the way we would do it. Part of that is because their language is different, and so they see the world differently. They see different connections in reality because they're putting their vision of reality together differently because of the words they use. If words are the building blocks of the way we understand reality and perception is our reality. I mean, perception is when we say, here's what's going on. This is what I think is actually happening. If the building blocks, the words that I use to build the reality that I'm operating from are built out of bad words, are built out of profanity, are built out of concepts like sex and, and excrement and condemnation, then the reality that I'm building myself are built out of those things. And that's about the opposite of the kingdom of God. That is the vile evilness of the destructive chaos of the devil. So Christians, we need to guard and temper and discipline 
our mouths, our language. If we can focus on not swearing, we can train our minds to think better, to think more positively and in terms of holiness. In some ways, swearing, using profanity, curse words, are the laziest, most base, and they make us dumber. The less articulate we are means the less tools we have in our toolbox for how to handle reality and how to interact with it and problem solve. But the more we push ourselves to speak more clearly and more precisely and more positively, then we can become holier by not miring our view of reality in terms of base, sex, condemnation, and excrement. You wouldn't want to live in a world built of those things. When we let profanity pervade our language, it dominates our mind, and those are the things we are constructing our reality from. We can do better. Remember that Christ himself is the word of God. Words matter. When God speaks them, all of creation is brought into existence. So, temper our language. If we want to live holy lives, if we want to do the work of God, we have to speak God's truth in holiness and divorce ourselves from the base, vile evilness of the world. Profanity gets in our mind and destroys our ability to think positively and to find holy solutions. It sees, it, for, profanity forces us to see the world as broken and kind of worthless. But the world was made good and it can be and will be redeemed. I want to be a part of that redemption. All Christians are called to be a part of that redemption of the world. And so that starts in our minds with tempering our language and pushing us to be more articulate and less corrupt and base. That's what St. James is calling us to. Now, Je Jesus today, and I want to cover this quickly because I know this is a little long, but these are complicated passages and they're deep. Now, our, our gospel today is Jesus basically calling us, oh, where is it? Let me get it right. St. Mark chapter 7, I think. Right? He's saying uh, the Pharisees and the scribes come to him and they're upset because the disciples have not washed their hands. And they say to him, uh, the Pharisees and some of the scribes came. Now, when they saw some of the disciples eat bread with defiled, that is unwashed, they found fault. Now, there is no commandment in the Torah that says you got to wash your hands. My mother does not like it when I point that out. Um, but there is none. And so what had happened was, and it is, it is a good practice to wash your hands. Certainly helps your health. But um, the Pharisees had developed this hand-washing ritual, and there was a little prayer that went with it. And so you would wash your hands and say this little prayer, and then... You would eat but they had tied that first of all they said this little ritual that they had developed it's not in the bible not in the scriptures they had made that a law well you better do it or else it's a sin and what jesus is saying is if it's not in there it's not a sin and jesus is referencing by meaning this passage from deuteronomy today you don't get to add to the commandments and you don't get to take away from the commandments. And you guys are adding on a bunch of stuff as necessary and then you hold people accountable like they've sinned if they haven't done it. But those aren't the rules. The rules are the rules. And y'all are adding stuff to them and y'all don't have the authority to do that, right? And that becomes a problem. And he's saying, actually, y'all even are worse than that. 
that you teach things that are not commandments. You add in doctrines and you teach them like they're commandments. And then you take the commandments and you twist them and change them so that you have an excuse not to do what is plainly written in there. Now, again, Jesus is combating this among the Jews. Y'all want to add to or take away from or change the commandments. And the church has had to deal this and battle this in every generation. And we're doing that now. These are ongoing wars. And I'm going to say this, and this is a bit strong and controversial, but I say this openly and publicly because I firmly believe it's the truth. Mainline Protestantism has all but fallen away from any semblance of Orthodox Christianity. And I believe we are in the last days where the last vestiges of kind of Orthodox Christian Protestantism are still just flickering, but those embers are dying. And the powers that be over very nearly all mainline Protestantism have taken us all towards terrible heterodoxy and worldliness. They have changed commandments, they have taken away commandments, and they have added commandments. No different than what Jesus is combating here. It's a terrible shame, but I've told my boys that my family has been Methodist on both sides, my mother and my father's side, since before Mississippi was a state. People often say I'm too formal or too rigid or too ritualistic to be a Methodist. And what I often counter is, you may not know Wesley as well as you should, because I'm a Methodist Methodist. I'm like Paul there saying, you want to know what kind of Jew I am? I'm a Jew's Jew. You want to know what kind of Methodist I am? Buddy, I'm a Methodist Methodist. I'm as Wesleyan as they come. My bona fides are concrete. That being said, by the time my boys are grown, I think it is doubtful, in fact, unlikely, that if they remain Orthodox Christians to raise my grandchildren, they will not do it in the United Methodist Church or any form of mainline Protestantism. And that saddens me. But Methodism was never going to save my soul. It is Christ and Orthodox Christianity through which I find Christ that will save my soul and save theirs. And so if that's what it takes, I will tell them, go to a more traditional Orthodox church. Be faithful to Christ and the commandments of God. Do not follow after men who would change commandments or add to the commandments or ignore the commandments. Be faithful to Christ. And so Jesus calls them out on the way that they are hypocrites, the way they change the law, the way they ignore laws or come up with silly little rules to get around things. They find loopholes, nonsense. And the only question, the reason is simple. They don't want to obey the law. They don't want to obey the law. If our faith does not call us to live differently than the world, and that's at a minimum, we're doing it wrong. The faith of Jesus Christ calls us to reject the sinfulness of the world and to live differently according to the commandments of God. And in humanity's hubris, every generation we think that we are wiser than the generations that have come before us, that we're smarter than our parents and grandparents, and that their rules were simple for simple people and don't apply to us because the world has changed and we're smarter. That is chronological snobbery and it is the height of narcissism, stupidity, and hubris. To be quite honest with you, in so many ways, I'm not half the man that my grandfather was and nor am I in many ways half the man my father was. And to think that I know better or am smarter than they are, I don't know that I have near the moral character that they have. And in humility, 
instead of thinking that the rules don't apply to me, I should get down on my knees and repent of my sin and every day seek to walk in God's commandments anew that I might be counted worthy to be his servant and carry the name Christian. I fall far short of that honor almost every day. Christians, if you're looking for the world's approval, you're barking up the wrong tree. God's approval is all that matters. And one day when we go to meet him, the world will pass away. Whether or not the world approved of us will not matter one bit. Find satisfaction in fulfilling the commandments. Don't add to, don't take away from, don't change, don't ignore. Now, this does lead to a question because there are many historical recriminations by Protestants, different bodies within Protestantism, pointing to our more liturgical traditions as to adding superfluous requirements. And to be more specific and to speak more plainly, often Protestants point to the Catholics and say, y'all add a bunch of stuff that isn't required and you're adding to the commandments. Historically, and I am Protestant, I think there may be some truth to that. But we also need to remember that even Christ acknowledges there is a difference between doctrines, theologies, and commandments. There is a hierarchy of truth in Christianity. Dogma are the things and teachings of Christianity that must be believed. The virgin birth, the resurrection, all those things, those are dogmas, and they must be believed. If it's in the creed, it's a dogma. We have to believe that. Then we have the doctrines. And these are strong teachings. These are things we, we generally consider to be important and probably true, but maybe not required to meet that qualification of Christian. And then there are the teachings, which are sometimes opinions. Uh, sometimes these are things that we say, well, some people think this and some people think that, and there's reasons for both, and we try to read the Bible carefully. But even Christians can disagree on some issues. Famously, and I'm sure you understand, the Calvinists versus the Wesleyans. We do not agree about how God runs the world, but those are teachings. Even the Presbyterians would certainly affirm, or even good ones, would affirm the apostles in Nicene Creed. Not all churches would use the creed. I know very famously the Southern Baptist Convention uh, sort of says no creed but the Bible. But surely the good ones, even if they don't use the creed, would say, but I firmly agree with it. That's what all Christians have believed forever. Christians agree on dogma. Now, we all get into our individual groups and we may disagree on some matters of doctrine and some of certain matters of teachings, theology and opinions. But let me offer this as an example. Let's talk about Lent and we'll close with this. So oftentimes, especially down home, Lent gets debated. My Baptist friends think it's such a Catholic thing and they think it's terrible. They will not touch it with a 10-foot pole. And we Methodists try to practice Lent. I, I'm told that when my parents were growing up, uh, basically some Methodists did and some Methodists didn't, and there was not a lot of good teaching across the board about Lent and Lenten discipline. I think as Methodists became increasingly urban throughout the South, uh, the urban churches became more like the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians and wanted to be more formal and more liturgical. And rural Methodists often were more evangelical and low church, low liturgy. Regardless, we would have these debates about Lent. 
uh, between often Methodists and Baptists in the South, and they would look at us and say, it's not necessary. You don't have to be saved. You don't have to have Lent and practice Lent to be saved. To which I would say, that's 100% true. You don't have to have Lent to be saved. Not required to be a Christian. That is true. I am not, I would never tell anyone that Lenten discipline is a commandment. It's not. It's an invitation. Lent can be, and Lenten discipline can be, a helpful practice by which we grow closer to God every season in preparation for Easter. Not a commandment, not a requirement, but it's a helpful practice. Just like washing your hands before you eat. Is it a sin to not wash your hands? Christ would say no. Is it a good idea to wash your hands and say a prayer before you eat? Yes. Yes, it is. Now, would I tell my Baptist friends that they're sinning by not practicing Lent? No, absolutely not. Would I tell them that Lent could actually help them grow closer to God? I would say, yeah, it's a helpful discipline. And there's a lot of things that our more traditional, more liturgical churches do uh, in the Orthodox Church, the way they use icons, the way they chant their services, the, the liturgy, how old it is, like 1,700 years old. It's beautiful. Remembering the saints, remembering, the, you know, when the Catholics use their rosaries, when the Catholics use these old prayers, when they talk about the saints. Are those required to be a Christian? I would say no. They're not dogmas. But are they helpful? I think for many, many Catholics and many, many Orthodox Christians, they enrich their Christian life and they help them grow closer to God. So, uh, same for us with our, with our hymns by Charles Wesley. Are singing the Charles Wesley hymns a commandment? Or is it required to be a Christian? No. Is it helpful to be a good, <laughs> to be a good Methodist? Yes. And I think any Christian could probably benefit from the Charles Wesley hymns, our great denomination's contribution to the, to the church at large. There needs to be an understanding of what is required and maybe then what is helpful. Encourage one another, but don't expect and demand that other people worship God exactly like we do. What's important is that we as Christians Believe what the creed teaches us. Believe in the commandments and practice them. Hold each other accountable in love and encourage one another in your faith. And remember Christ's commandment to the church that we love one another as he loved us. And what does that look like? When the Lord himself got down and humbled himself and washed his disciples' feet. Even Judas. All right, we love you. God loves you. We'll see you next week. Say bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.